this Bible off of me. It's too restrictive. Oh, man, the weight of this ankle monitor can't take it anymore. Too many rules. Can't do this, but you can do that. I call that a bunch of hogwash. Ah, fooey, tell me I keep these commandments. Well, I heard they've been done away with. We don't need to keep them anymore. Is the Bible restrictive? What does the Bible say? What really is restrictive? Hello, my fellow influencers. This is Donald with Show Me Your ID. And the identity journey starts here. Uncle Silas, are you ranting about keeping the Ten Commandments? The way you drag that Bible around, who would want to keep it? God's laws aren't restrictive. Actually, the opposite is true. David the psalmist writes this in Psalm 103, verse 2. Blessed, affectionately, gratefully praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all or one of all his benefits. Hear that, Uncle Silas? David says he will not forget one of God's benefits. So those commandments are actually a benefit to us. Uh, just think of it this way, Uncle Silas. If um, somebody came and wanted to take away your soybean field that you worked so diligently on, or let's just say they confiscated or actually stole your tractor, do you know that God had written an eighth commandment where it says, Thou shalt not steal? That's a benefit, right? Because do you want something stolen from you? David also writes about how God's law is a delight. He says in Psalm 119, verse 47, these very words, and I will delight myself in your commandments, which I love. Did you catch that, Uncle Silas? David says, I love your commandments. They are a delight. Also in that same psalm, in verse 174, he writes again these words, I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Um, again, we see over and over these words, the law is a delight. Um, it's not a burden, it's a delight. Also, do you remember Saul in the New Testament who was persecuting Christians? Well, then later he would become a Christian, and he wrote an amazing chapter, Romans 7, about the Christian struggle. You had mentioned, you know, can't do this and can do that earlier, Uncle Silas. Well, that's kind of what Paul was writing in Romans 7. He says, the things I don't want to do that I do do, and the things I do want to do I don't. But he also says something very significant in Romans 7, verse 12, and he writes these words to us, and he says, Therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. He also says in verse 22, For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. And I'm remindful as I saw you dragging that Bible on your ankle there, and you're saying it was too heavy for you. I can do this, and I can do this. And a lot of us as Christians, we really try to white-knuckle our relationship with Jesus and with God. And we think, well, I've got to keep these commands. I've got to do it. But... The only one that was obedient, Uncle Silas, was Jesus. He was the only one that was obedient, was able to keep the commands, but through him, a beautiful scripture here I should plug in is Philippians 4.13, which says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Also somewhere else in scripture he says that my strength is made perfect in your weakness. So, yes, we are weak to keeping the commands of God, but through Christ, as we surrender to him, we can keep those commands. We don't have to white-knuckle it. Um, so maybe so we have to drag this heavy load around. We don't have to. We can give it to Jesus. Still doesn't explain why we have to keep it. When Jesus was nailed to the cross, he did away with the law. Everybody knows that. Don't you find that confusing? Why would God establish a law then take it away? Does that make sense? 1 Corinthians 14 verse 33 tells us these words. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. He is of peace, so his law brings peace. What does Jesus have to say about this? Did Jesus tell us he came to do away with or change the law? God forbid, in his own words, we read in Matthew 5, verse 17 and 18, these words, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. I want to ask you a question, Uncle Silas. Has the heaven and earth passed away yet? I haven't seen it in my lifetime. I'm, it's not happened in the past. So if it has not passed away, guess what? The law is still binding. It's still here. It's, 
it's, it's a standard by which we must conduct our lives. He also said in John 14, verse 15, these words, If you love me, keep my commandments. Or I like to add, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Why wouldn't you? If Jesus paid everything for you on the cross and laid it all down, why wouldn't you want to keep his commandments? He's paid everything for you. It's all paid off. Do you know why Jesus came to this earth as fully God and fully man? No, I don't. The Bible tells us this in 1 John 3, verse 8. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So we see that Satan here, or the devil, originated sin, not only in heaven, but he brought it here to this earth. Do you know what the Ten Commandments really are? No. Not sure where you're going with this. They're a reflection of His mercy and grace. They're a reflection of His love for His creation. They're a representation of His character or His identity. We can identify God by His commandments. Uncle Silas, I think you see the commandments as a set of rules. Did you know that there were times in history where people saw God and His Word just like you? Really? I wasn't aware of this! Yes. The Bible tells us about the Israelites and how they were God's chosen people, but they didn't see God in the right perspective. They didn't trust God. Instead, they wanted to follow after other nations, and actually, they wanted a king like the other kingdoms. But just like the rest of us, they tried so hard in their own strength to do what was right. Jeremiah 17, verse 9 tells us these very words. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Do you know what happened to Israel? I guess they walked away from God. Correct. In Judges 21, verse 25, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Ouch. In his own eyes. The Bible proves that history repeats itself. Solomon wrote these words in the Bible, that there is nothing new under the sun. And as we learn in Jeremiah 17, verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So if we take a look back in history, we do find in the Dark Ages, a very dark period of this earth's history, that there was a particular church that rose up in power, this Romanistic church. As it rose, it suppressed the Word of God. It actually chained Bibles to the walls, and people could not get the truth as they kind of butchered the truth. Um, they muddied it. And it made it very difficult for people to find God, to connect with God. So they began to oppress individuals. They began to strip them of their land, um, of their dignity, of their, uh, of their God-given right to learn about the God who they want to worship and serve. And as they stripped this away, people began to rebel. They got angry and agitated. We find this happening in a country by the name of France. In this country, there was dark period there. But a man did rise to uh, share the light. This man's name was Calvin. I believe it was in the 1500s. He was an educated man. Um, actually, it was his dad wanted him to be a lawyer. He wanted to be a priest, but he became a reformer. And he shared um, about the Bible, and he shared the truth about Jesus as he began to grow uh, more and more convicted about what to share. And as this began to happen, we had a group called the Albigenses, who were kind of like these individuals called the Waldensians. They held true to God's principles and His Word. And they began to be uh, sought after and hunted down. Uh, there was a time in the 1500s where it was called the uh, St. Bartholomew Massacre. And many people were lost their lives for what they believed in. Actually, it was estimated around 70,000 people were murdered or butchered in two months' time for standing up for the Word of God. This is how much people could not stand those who were holding firm to the commandments of God and to the basic principles of the Bible. So as this oppression became more and more heavy through the periods of time from the 1500s, then we're traveling to the 1600s and now into the 1700s, so many people got agitated and irritated by the authority of that time, the Roman church, that they wanted nothing to do with God. The authority of these, um, this uh, popish uh, Roman authority, they could not stand it. So what they did is they actually swung the opposite way and they went completely, as they call it, atheistic. They, that's when atheism rose up in power in France. So they tossed out the Bible, they burned them, they hunted down people. Everybody was a law unto themselves, just like we read again in uh, Judges 21-25. Every man did right was in his own sight. So they 
Whatever they thought was right, they just did it. That was a lawless society. There was a lot of violence. There was a lot of lustful things. They even actually um, chose this woman. I can't remember. Sophia Moram. I can't even say her name. Sophia something was her name. Anyways, they lifted her up and promoted her as the uh, queen of reason or the um, goddess, I should say, goddess of reason. They um, kind of par paraded her around and they had festivals for weeks about throwing all, out this um, Bible. They rejoiced greatly at the thought of you know, all these Protestant people, those who followed the Bible being destroyed and killed. They actually rang bells. They even murdered uh, kings and statesmen and artists and all these people that were gifted in a lot of ways. So people fled and uh, it just began a downward spiral for France as they threw out the Bible, completely threw it out. Um, interestingly enough, this gentleman by the name of Voltaire very instrumental in um, trying to de-Christianize France. And what we find in there in history is that he actually, as he perished or passed away, uh, his home became a place where they collected and stored Bibles, <laughs> interestingly enough. But the fact is that uh, many people, they saw that it was so deplorable, the state of affairs there in France at that time, because they threw out the Bible, that they had no standard, they had no um, foundation to stand on, there was no law, it was all lawlessness. Uh, we can kind of see that happening in our world today, so we definitely have to have something to stand on. And the only thing we can really stand firmly on is God's Word, the Bible. The Bible is what gives us our direction, our compass, our moral uh, reasoning and judgment. And if we don't have that, we don't have a standard at all, we're just floating along. So um, just a, a reminder of this, that um, this Bible that we talk about. It's not an anchor, it's not an um, ankle monitor, it's not heavy, it's not burdensome, it's not grievous as the Bible says in 1 John 5, 3, but it's actually a delight because it brings so much solace and peace and a harmony. It actually helps us have wisdom. It's really important that we uh, stand firm on the commandments of God and on what the Bible says. So we can see the significance of God's commandments. If we throw them out, just like France in the 1790s, I believe it was 1793 to 1794, about three and a half years, they had thrown out the Bible, and they learned rather quickly that if they do that, they've lost a sure foundation, and everything just goes to chaos. 1 Corinthians 14.33 says this, that God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. So those words in that Bible bring us peace. If you're interested in finding out more about the um, time of the French Revolution, there is a great book I suggest. It's called The Great Controversy. The Great Controversy is an amazing, powerful book that opened my eyes to see the history, not only of the church, but the history of this world and the history of kind of where we're heading. Um, and I'll leave some links in the description down below. Uh, I've got a great um, site you can go to that will actually show you uh, videos some of it from the French Revolution, and I also have another uh, channel uh, called uh, Lineage. Great stuff. I love them. Pretty sharp stuff in that they um, put together about five, six-minute videos uh, concerning Calvin and some things. So I'll put some links down there for you all to check out. And while we're at that, be sure to uh, like and subscribe to this channel that we can get you more content that you enjoy. And that we're hoping that this um, journey that we're on, this identity journey, will draw you closer to know who you are and whose you are and that the identity journey will give you strength and courage that you are a son or daughter of God and that you can have peace as you follow Jesus and follow his footsteps. Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Join us next time and show me your ID.
praise the Lord, he took my sin. Oh, praise God. Uh, and brothers and sisters, I want you to join me on this journey to find freedom as a as a son or daughter of God. I just, I, I feel so alive. It's amazing. Uh, praise the Lord. Keep moving and let's just keep journeying together. Praise the Lord. I feel so free. Praise God. Oh, praise God. I can't believe it. Thank you, Donald, for sharing that, that information with me. It just it opened my understanding a little more of a, a God of love. And I just thank you so much, Donald. Man, this Bible, I once saw it as an ankle monitor, but now I, I don't want to ever part from it. I, I, I want to read it. I want to eat the Word of God. I want to eat my mustache, too. It's all over my mouth, and I can't, I can't, I can't hardly talk because I'm so excited. <laughs>